So I have 15 minutes to tell you about 10 years of my life and answer one question. Why did I leave fashion? And first, I know. Uh, you don't really leave fashion. It would be like saying I stopped breathing. I can't leave fashion because I dress up every day. But if you really want, you can leave fashion week. And like any breakup, it's scary and emotional, but at some point in the process, you realize it was nobody's fault and everything will be okay. I started in 2006 as an illustrator with very few jobs, and in a last attempt at doing something with my life, I opened a blog. It was a very long time ago. In an effort to share my illustrations directly with people, I put them online. My life so far seemed like a lot of poking at walls in the dark, and like suddenly, my destiny opened. My work was noticed a few weeks after opening the blog. Stories were written about my texts and my drawings. People started calling me for jobs. And I moved to Paris. Paris was when I finally encountered Fashion Week. Even though I had a pretty strong fashion culture, um, I discovered a new set of people uh, that I didn't know existed. And they were so cool. I started publishing photos of, of them on my blog, and people loved that. My photos were going beyond the boundaries of my French world. My universe was suddenly expanding. And unknowingly, I was also expanding the editor's world, too. At that time, nobody knew who Karine Watfeld was. When I first published her photos, I'm not even sure I put up her name. It wasn't a thing. My first street-style photos were only about style. I shot all year on the streets, but Fashion Week became like a special moment, a rendezvous with my audience, if you will. They were hungry for this new approach to fashion. The shows were still very B2B place, and if the showgoers were chic, there was still a sense of natural measure. They were wearing their real clothes. It felt authentic. You remember? <laughs> and it felt like I was opening doors to a secret world. All that I loved and couldn't find in magazines anymore. I'm a kid of the 90s, so I grew up with grunge, Bjork, The Face. There was Scott, Tommy, and me. We were making the editors famous. But I think my audience was also fascinated by my rags to riches story. They liked my photos, my drawings, and my crazy fashion story. I was the innocent soul thrown into the glamorous world. It was too good to be true, but it was true. I also didn't realize at the time, but I was a boundary pusher. I get bored easily. I want to grow, I want to change. I was the first one to talk about luxury online. I got backlash, but I believed that one day the internet wouldn't just be for cheap hauls and good deals. This was about 14, 13 years ago, so it's crazy to think how it changed. I thought the internet would be for everyone was also the first one to understand the power of a layout online. I was always pushing my webmasters to do better. I trained myself on Photoshop to make my images as beautiful as I saw them in my head. I always thought of the web as equal, if not superior, to print. I would never settle for mediocrity. Why? Um, well, first, because to me, images look better on a light box. The second, immediacy. No need to explain. The third reason, there was no boundaries. My audience went from Brazil to France to Japan to Australia. I could talk to 20 markets simultaneously. And finally, the power of conversion. There were no real tools for measure measurement at the time, but I started hearing from brands. Garance, your last post about our pants made them sell out. People came in the with the photo in our store. It wasn't yet the, the age of net porte but I was moving people into stores. I couldn't believe it. And all these people online, I realized, they're like me. They're real. So there started my years of full expansion. It came as a whirlwind of photos and traveling and going up the ranks of fashion. From sneaking inside the shows to sitting front row to getting a CFD award. It wasn't easy, actually. Fashion was still a closed world, and each step forward would mean a lot of hidden struggles. Most people at the helm of magazines and IM department stores were still basking in their unquestioned power. Press on one side, 
editors on the other, uh, buyers on the other side, and I was there in the middle, sitting wherever they found spot for me. Every season would be the same. Seats would be reserved, egos coddled. I was looked at as a, an anomaly that would go away fast and very often treated as one. So much so that, at some point, when I got offered a job at a very important magazine, um, I almost said yes. I wanted to say yes to money, which I didn't have much at the time, to status and to a little bit of power, and to finally stop being treated like shit. <laughs> But as I was negotiating with the publisher, I could feel all the weight of bureaucracy crush me already. I was not even yet on payroll. And that for a little bit of fashion week power that actually no one cares about in the real world, I would give up so much freedom and have to deal with huge pressure over my head. So I kept taking shit, had a lot of fun too, I cried so much, survived, <laughs> and one day I realized I had made it. People were walking me to my seat at fashion shows. Until, that, until then, even with the bullshit, All these were still interesting to me and gave me so much to talk about. It wasn't, I didn't really care about the front row, it was more about all those, the material, all the stories. But the thing is, for me, the stories tend to dry out after a while. I'm the kind of storyteller that needs to keep on moving. I just can't just sit and comment. So every season, I attacked Fashion Week from a different angle. It started with the street style and then soon it changed. Editors had caught up to how much they could get from these newfound celebrity, and they started playing the game, and really hardcore. A lot of them used Fashion Week to make their name, which was great for them, but not so much for me. Their outfits became more sophisticated than editorials. And like that, we were back at square one. So, as the doors of fashion were opening to me, I decided to take my reader with me. Backstage, designers, photos, videos, everything I could do to keep it interesting to my audience, but also to myself. Then, at some point, I realized the only thing I was left to do was to turn the camera on me, and I just, I just didn't like it. The world around me had changed, a new crop of bloggers... Oh, look at my face on that photo. <laughs> Depression. A new crop of bloggers had seen the first generation success, me, and they were not kidding around. It was all about building up their personality, and I got caught in a new system that I didn't really have the taste for. So I tried. Get flown for a show, dress up in the clothes the brand would now send me pre-shows, no matter the fit, say good things about them, shake their hands, make some money, and repeat. I knew something went wrong at this point for me. Let's just say all this is not really my spirit. I tried to play the game for a few seasons, but I think at this point my fantastic love story with fashion has just, had just transformed into a, a sort of a, a weird job. By the way, from being our top performing weeks of the year, Fashion Week content had gone down at the lowest. The trend had come and gone, and here we were, us, the new promising generation, delivering even more crap and fakeness than our elders. I started being really heartbroken because I had believed in all this. I think I got my first real heartburn at one of these cruise collections. We had been flown first class to a crazy destination and covered head to toe in presents and clothes and caviar and champagne, living a life of luxuries, very addictive. You start doing whatever is demanded of you just to get on a yacht. Hi. You lose sight of who you really are. What's your real role in this world? Because, you know, the truth is that there are no free gifts. So you start taking too many selfies, you completely lose touch with your reader, who's kind of the most important part of all of this. Your ego inflates and deflates at the same time when you go back to your average life and you want more. You become ridiculous, picturing the nauseating amount of presents waiting for you on your bed as if you were some princess in a fairy tale. And you do anything for more, even lose your dignity. I, deci I decided to stop attending these. Uh, it was just too much for me. I would have liked to have been less sensitive to be able to just enjoy it, but I couldn't. I also started seeing the system I remember very well 
going to Shanghai with Dior and interviewing John Galliano, or what was left of him at the time. The discrepancy between the image that was shown of the genius and the actual poor man I barely was able to have a conversation with that day literally broke my heart. We had filmed an interview for my show. I had been flown first class, da da da, our show through the airport like I was Lady Gaga, was told I could spend <laughs> as much time as I wanted at the spa, which is my favorite thing in the world, so they really knew me at this moment, and all that stuff. But when I told the brand that I would not publish the interview out of respect for them and the creator, I got so much pushback, which I understand. The pressure at this time was at this maximum. Millions has been spent, and as a PR, you have to count your credits. I pushed back and back and explained my point of view and risked my relationship with one of the most powerful luxury brands. But they were smart at Dior, they got it. And I think they didn't want to see, but deep down, they knew. A few months later, the scandal happened. That disconnect between the star power a designer had been given and the actual work they were doing had gone to an insane height. It was not art anymore, and gosh, was Galliano an artist. It was image and business. I started seeing the disconnect. Most clothes we would see on the runway would never hit the stores. Clothes for one day, gone tomorrow. Sample sales, sales, mountains of clothes nobody bought. Insane cult of personality at every level of the industry. Designers bouncing from one brand to the next, it all became a blur to me. Like a monster looking at itself in the mirror, satisfied. Always more and more and more. And just like this one day, I had a breakdown. I was on my way to a Chloe show. The Chloe show was one of these shows where the excitement runs really high. For a few seasons now, I had been seated with all the new influencers, and to be honest, it was quite dreadful. <laughs> I swear I tried, but I just, I just wasn't that girl. Taken separately, everyone is, is nice. But the fight for power on the front row was exhausting, empty, and so ridiculous. I come from a small island that's very provincial, and kind of really felt the same. I had no stories to tell anymore, but I wanted to be a good girl, so I pushed and pushed and pushed. And one day, before this Chloe show, in my bedroom, surrounded by designer clothes, I broke down. I started crying, and I couldn't stop. It had been years now that I had tried to talk to my friend about these feelings. She knows. <laughs> All I would get was, you have a dream life, don't let go. So I called the only person I knew would listen, Emily, my business partner, is here. She said, put yourself to bed, and we're going to figure this out. You never have to go to another show. And so this is what we did. We let go of the fear of the industry discarding us if we didn't play the game. We refocused on what we love. We changed the way we do content. I let go of Fashion Week, leaving it to people who actually enjoy it. We're still so much about fashion, but in a way that's personal, like probably it was in the beginning. We sell a lot of clothes through our content and partner with a lot of brands. Just things that we and our readers believe in. So Imran asked me to tell you what I think when I look at Fashion Week now. And to be very honest, I don't look at Fashion Week. Nor do my friends, and they do love fashion. I check the designers I love, of course, but this is not where I place my finger to feel the pulse anymore. The world has changed, and it's flat again. The hierarchy has broken down. We don't have to wait for designers to tell us what to wear and for magazines to tell us what to think. I work with brands to develop their strategies, and I do think, in most cases, Fashion Week is the least interesting place today to invest their resources. Often, it's very quickly forgotten content, which is something I think fashion did to itself by always wanting more, bigger, and faster. There are many solutions. I just don't know if they can be done as a collective anymore. It's no longer about being a part of a whole and having access to press, press and retailer. Now that you can talk directly to the consumer, each brand needs to focus on their very own strategy. It's fascinating and liberating, and there is so much power in it. All you need to do is uh, dare to let go of the fear, do what you believe in. And I guess that's how you become a boundary pusher. Thank you.